Hello family, I'm going to do a bit more reading of As a Human Thinketh today, because I want to read some more, I want to read some more to you, do a bit more uh, lecturing, let's get straight into it. Last time we finished the chapter, the first main chapter called Thought and Character. Today we start The Effect of Thought on Circumstance. A man's... Oh, okay keeping it in the human realm. Uh, one's mind may be likened to a garden, a garden, which may be intelligently cultivated or allowed to run wild. But whether cultivated intelligently or neglected, it must and will bring forth. If no useful seeds are put into it, then an abundance of useless weed seeds will fall in and will continue to produce their kind. Just as a gardener cultivates his plot, keeping it free from weeds and growing the flowers and fruits which, re which they require, so may one tend the garden of their mind, weeding out all the wrong and useless, impure thoughts and cultivating towards perfection the flowers and fruits of right, useful and pure thought. By, per by pursuing this process, a man sooner or later discovers that he is the master gardener of his soul, the director of his life. I apologize, I keep, it's easier just to read it and it's in his, but I like to put it in the tense of one so that anyone can relate to it easier, but I do slip every now and then. <laughs> one also reveals within oneself the laws of thought and understands with ever-increasing accuracy how the thought forces and mind elements operate in shaping of one's character, circumstances, and destiny. Thought and character are one, and as character can only manifest and discover itself through environment and circumstance, the outer conditions of a person's life will always be found to be harmoniously related to their inner state. This does not mean that a man's this does not mean that one's circumstances at any given time are an indication of their entire character, but that those circumstances are so intimately connected with some vital thought element within themselves that for the time being they are indispensable to their development. Everyone is where they are by the law of this by the law of their being. The thoughts which they have built into their character have brought them here, and in the arrangement of their life there is no element of chance, but all is the result of a law which cannot err. This is just as true of those who feel out of harmony with their surroundings as those who are contented with them. As a progressive and evolving being, we are... We are we are where we are, so that we may learn, and so that we may grow. As we learn the spiritual lesson which any circumstance contains for us, it will pass away and give rise to new circumstances. We are buffeted by circumstances so long as we believe ourselves to be the creature of outside conditions. But when we realize that we are a creative power, and that we may command the hidden soil and seeds of our being out of which circumstances grow, then we become the rightful master of ourselves, of our mind. That circumstances grow out of thought, every man knows for who has, for, for who has at any length of time practiced self-control and self-purification. For one will notice that their alteration in one's circumstances has been in exact ratio with the alteration in one's mental condition. So true is this, that when a man earnestly applies oneself to remedy the defects of his character, <laughs> so true is it, that when one earnestly applies oneself to the remedy applies himself to remedy the defects in one's characters and makes swift and marked progress, 
that one will pass rapidly through a succession of vicissitudes. All right, we've reached another word that I'm not sure what means. What the fuck is a vicissitude? Let's have a little, uh, let's have a little look. <laughs> Define vicissitude. V I C I S I double V I C I double S I T U T D Okay, vicissitude. Vicissitude, a change of circumstance or fortune, typically one that is unwelcome or unpleasant. Okay. So, does that does that make sense as a more unpleasant thing? So, I uh, mean, he passes. So, that doesn't make sense as a negative thing here. The literary definition is just an alteration between opposing or contrasting things. So, contrasting circumstances. So, if we change our the, the perspective of our mind, if we change our the content of our thought, then the outside transformation of our circumstance will be in that ratio and and the the circumstances that arise from that will essentially be contrasting to the extent that the thoughts that we maintain are contrasting. The extent to which we develop our thoughts and that they contrast with our old way of thinking, similarly will our circumstances contrast with the way they used to appear to us. Vicissitudes. <laughs> All right, let's continue. The soul attracts that which it secretly harbors, that which it loves, and also that which it fears. It reaches the height of its cherished aspirations, and it falls to the level of its unchastened desires. Circumstances are but the means by which the soul receives its own. Every thought, seed, sown, or allowed to fall into the mind, and to take root there, produces its own, blossoming sooner or later into act and bearing its own fruitage of opportunity and circumstance. Good thoughts bear good fruit. Bad thoughts, bad fruit. Um, I'd like to note here as well the, the specification that over time, those thought seeds that fall into our mind will blossom into act. What we maintain within our mind is the expression that we act out. We don't act out anything that's uh, different from how we think. So if we if we want to change how we act in the world, it starts within the garden of the mind. And the flourishing of those particular seeds or the change of a mental attitude will equate to the change of opportunity externally. Through, through the, and that's the important part, through your actions. Your actions are what mediate this. Begins in the mind, allows you to mediate your actions, and then the circumstances will, of your life will change. From my perspective. Alright, back to the book. The outer world of circumstance shapes itself to the inner world of thought. And both pleasant and unpleasant external conditions are factors which make for the ultimate good of the individual. As the reaper of his own harvest, man learns both by suffering and bliss. Following the inmost desires, aspirations, thoughts by which one allows oneself to be dominated, pursuing the will-o'-the-wisps of impure imaginations and steadfastly walking the highway of strong and high endeavour, one at last will arrive at their fruition and fulfillment in the outer conditions of life. The laws of growth and adjustment everywhere obtain. Um, I just realized I'm enunciating quite into the, uh, you know what I'm saying, the microphone. So I'm just going to grab the pop filter in case that's quite unpleasant. <laughs> Give me one moment, my family. I love you all so much. I hope you have an incredible listening. I hope whatever you're doing right now, you're finding purpose in. And I fucking love you, and I'm going to keep reading to you in a moment. As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. We're calling it As a Human Thinketh. But James Allen, nonetheless, bless you. I mean, grab the pop filter.
All right, we good. We good. That's good. <coughs> I didn't think I would have enough space. That's why I didn't put it there originally. All right. One does not come to the pothouse or the jail, the pothouse. One does not come to the jail by the tyranny of fate or circumstance, but by the pathway of groveling thoughts and base desires. Nor does a pure-minded person fall suddenly into crime by stress of any mere external force. The criminal thought must have long, long been secretly fostered in the heart, and the hour of opportunity revealed its gathered power. Circumstance does not make the man. It reveals one to themselves. No such condition can exist as descending... No such conditions can exist as descending into vice and its attendant sufferings apart from vicious inclinations or ascending into virtue and its pure happiness without the continued cultivation of virtuous aspiration. And one is therefore the lord and master of thought, the maker of oneself, and the shaper and author of their environment. That was a very long sentence. Uh, f f I f yeah. <laughs> Even at birth, the soul comes to its own. And through every step of its earthly pilgrimage, it attracts those combinations of which can attracts those combinations of conditions which reveal itself. What? <laughs> I'm gonna read that one again. Such wordy James Allen motherfucker. Even at the birth, even at birth, the soul comes to its own, and through every step of its earthly pilgrimage, it attracts those combinations of conditions which reveal itself which are the reflections of its own purity and impurity, its strength and weakness. Okay. One does not attract which they want, but that which they are. Their whims, fancies, and ambitions are thwarted at every step, but their innermost thoughts and desires are fed with their own food, be it foul or clean. The divinity that shapes our ends is in ourselves. It is our very self. And we are manacled only by ourself. Thought and action are the jailers of fate. They imprison being base. They are also the angels of freedom. They liberate being noble. Not what one wishes and prays for does one get, but what one justly earns. One's wishes and prayers are only gratified and answered when they harmonize with one's thoughts and actions. In the light of this truth, what then is the meaning of fighting against circumstance? It means that one is continually revolting against an effect within, rather, sorry, let me ref. It means that one is continually revolting against an effect without, while all the time he is nourishing and preserving its cause in his own mind and within one's heart. That's an, I'm going to reread that because it's important. If one is fighting against circumstances, if one finds themselves fighting against circumstances, it means that one is continually revolting against an effect in their outside world, while all the time nourishing and preserving its cause, the cause found within the garden of the mind, one's heart, one's soul. That cause may take the form of a conscious vice or an unconscious weakness. Oh, the, the specific cause may take the form of a conscious vice or an unconscious weakness, but whatever it is, it stubbornly slows and slows the efforts of its possessor, and thus calls aloud for remedy. Men are anxious, to, we are all anxious to improve our circumstances, but are unwilling to improve ourselves, and we are therefore remain bound to ourselves. 
one who does not shrink from self-crucifixion, can never fail to accomplish the object upon which his heart is set. That's an important one, and I need to reread that because it took me a while to understand what the hell it was saying. One who does not shrink from self-crucifixion can never fail to accomplish the object upon which their heart is set. Self-crucifixion. What does that mean? I see it as meaning we each have, uh, we'll put it simply, we each have a conscience. We each have insight within ourselves as to knowing how we should act, how we should be, and how we would like to be, how we would like to act within the world. Self-crucifixion is being honest with ourselves that what we are is not what we need to be, ultimately. Well, it's what we need to be in this moment, but it's it's transient. It's towards something greater. We must relinquish ourselves, uh, our identity, for something larger. And all of us, at this point, just by the very fact that we're human, uh, are living in that point, wanting to grow into something larger. And so, self-crucifixion is the act of looking into oneself honestly and seeing oneself shadows, one's vices, what one wishes one could be, how one wishes one could act, and crucifying the self that one is currently so that you can re- be reborn into the person you know yourself to be transforming into. You do this by crucifying your current self, which is removing the weeds of your mind, which you don't want there anymore, which you know you shouldn't have, but yet you're nourishing. So, one who no longer shrinks, who no longer is destroyed by self-crucifixion, who lives up to their ideal, can never fail to accomplish the object upon which their heart is set. That's motherfucking powerful. This shit, that, and it's the truth. That's, fuck, man. Fuck all of, uh, it, it blows my mind. Thank you. Thank you, James Allen. Thank you, James Allen. Thank you, the printing press, for printing this. Thank you, the universe, for delivering this book to me several years ago. Like, there's nothing more important than this. There's nothing more important than knowing that your ability to transform your own mind, to seek honestly within your heart, to see what you could be, and to transform, to crucify your current self, to transform into that, that, that there's nothing worth doing in my eyes in this life other than that. <laughs> it gets me fired up. All right. Uh, let's bring it back down. I'll keep reading. <laughs> How long have we got left for this chapter? Long chapter. We'll see if it uh, makes sense to come to an end at any paragraph soon. <clears throat> so to restate, one who does no longer shrink from self-crucifixion can never fail to accomplish the object upon which their heart is set. This is as true of earthly as of heavenly things, for even one whose sole object is to acquire wealth must be prepared to make great personal sacrifices before he can accomplish this object. And how much more so must one how much more so must one sacrifice if one wishes to realize a strong and well-poised life. How much must we sacrifice? Well, that's it. We have to sacrifice who we think we are. That's the greatest thing, ultimately. I think we're going to leave it there, to be honest, because it kind of... It goes into an example in the next paragraph. Seems to be a perfect point to end it. We've been going for almost 20 minutes. I've been liking doing these slightly longer ones. Um, Last video uploaded was a week ago today, motherfuckers. So, 
I've at least managed to be on a weekly schedule at this point. So you'll be guaranteed at least another video before the end of this next week. But to be honest, reading the book and also sharing my thoughts, I'd like to do at least one of them a week. You know, I could move up to that much. So I'm going to read to you at least once more by the end, by, by a week's time from now. And we're going to share some more thoughts and just feel the love of the community. Let's let's share how we're feeling, motherfuckers. Um, damn. All right. 20 minutes. Cool. Okay. So we're page 20, halfway through the chapter. The effect of thought on circumstance. As a man thinketh by James Allen. I love you guys so much. I uh, I hope you liked the video yesterday with me and her ex. Um, I hope you're feeling purpose right now in your life. Uh, and if you weren't, I hope you're at least feeling a little bit more. Um, like I hope a lot of things, but uh, what's the point in that? <laughs> I love you so much. See you later.